Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. It's Stavros Mastorginis, and he is one of our podcast um, experts. On He has his own podcast show, and he's part of our podcast community team, and he helps to teach people about fitness. He coaches, and he helps people lose weight and get into better health. And today he's going to talk about the true Mediterranean diet and what that really means. So I'm going to hand it over to Stavros and he is going to talk about the true Mediterranean diet and help you improve your overall health. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm really excited to talk about it because I think is you hear about the Mediterranean diet all the time. And I think it's ranked number one now as with the healthiest diets. But I think a lot of experts have left out parts of the diet, which I think are very critical yeah. to uh, good health. And um, so that's what I want to talk about it today. So, you know, if I ask you, you know, what do you think of the Mediterranean diet? You know, what's it, what is it about? What comes to mind? You know, what are the first things that come to mind? Right? Mostly the foods that we eat and the foods we don't eat. Yes. You know, and I think pretty much everybody talks about that. In fact, uh, the, one of the shows I was watching, uh, the Blue Zones, which Ikaria, one of the Greek islands, is part of the Blue Zones. That's areas on earth that people live long, healthy lives. Yes. They talk about the food. And again, they left out some very important aspects of it, which are Mediterranean cultures overall don't eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something nobody talks about. In fact, one of the shows I was watching, they were talking about what people in Mediterranean culture eat for breakfast. What they talked about was what we ate on the weekends. A uh, little uh, background, I was actually born and raised on the Greek island. So I was raised on the Mediterranean diet. So I can talk, you know, uh, I've seen it firsthand. I was raised with it, so I, I really know it. I didn't just study, <laughs> you know, I want to say that to the audience, you know. So I didn't just study Mediterranean diet. And so that's the first thing I want to talk about is like, we did not eat breakfast. On the weekend, sometimes we ate something, but during the week, even as kids, my parents never forced us to eat something in the morning. Now, if we were hungry, we ate. If we were not hungry, we did not eat. Adults, on the other hand, I would say 90% of the time did not eat breakfast. Right. That we have some Greek coffee, which is basically the same thing as uh, like close to espresso with no milk, mm -hmm. and that's all they would have, and they would go to work. And the first thing that we eat, it would be at lunchtime. And somehow they survived till the lunchtime without eating breakfast. Because I, I keep hearing this thing about, oh, you got to eat breakfast for energy. Says who? I mean, who came up with that? Right. And and that's, by the way, because when I took nutrition in school here in, in, in the States, one of the first things that I learned was breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Mm -hmm. And I remember actually I raised my hand in one of the classes and I said, well, when I lived in Greece, I ne we never ate breakfast. And we're, and we're very healthy and thin. Yeah. And actually, that it's interesting. The teacher just dismissed me. <laughs> like it was you know, like an exception or something. And she went down with the class. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me. And I'm like, well, how come here they're teaching us that breakfast is the most important meal of the day? And yet, in Greece, nobody ate breakfast. Right. And then when I started looking at other uh, healthy regions, like the blue zones, you notice the same thing. Yeah. Breakfast is not a main meal. Now, do they eat breakfast sometimes on the weekend? Yes, they do. I mean, but as a gen, uh, generally speaking, breakfast isn't something that people eat. Right. And what I found out was the reason we believe that breakfast is the most important meal of the day is because of smart marketing. Mm -hmm. In marketing nowadays, you can convince basically people to believe whatever you want. If right. you have a really good marketing team, I can get you to believe whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And that's how we start believing that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And, and to me, the benefits are tremendous because uh, by going for 16 hours or longer without food, and by the way, by skipping breakfast, you get, you get to go for at least 16 hours without eating. So let's say, you know, typically people finish eating dinner by 8 o'clock, let's say. Yeah. And then if you eat the next day around 12, that's your 16 hours. Well, like similar to intermittent fasting in a sense, that's what we basically did. Right. You know, and that was part of our culture. The benefits are tremendous. Number one, it makes your body more efficient at burning fat. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we want? Right. You know, it makes your body more efficient, uh, uh, more sensitive to insulin. 
prevents mm-hmm. diabetes. It makes your body more sensitive to leptin. That's the hormone that tells your brain that you're full. Yes. So by skipping breakfast and going for prolonged periods, mm-hmm. your brain becomes more sensitive, which means you get fuller easier. Yes. And then you have the process called autophagy that starts taking place, which is a process that the body gets rid of mutated and dysfunctional cells, which is the precursors to a lot of cancers. Yeah. And then also gets rid of uh, misfolded proteins, which are the precursors to a lot of the mental diseases. Yes. So to me, that's why Ikaria, which is, I, I, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I think it's like one third of the population is over the age of 90. Yeah. And there's virtually no mental disease on the island. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, we only have been looking at what they eat. And we try to give credit to the foods that they eat, which, by the way, they eat very healthy foods. Yeah. But they forgot that how they eat. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's one thing. They, they, they don't eat. They go for six hours all along without eating. The yeah. other thing they keep in mind, how do they eat? Like, how do we eat in Greece? Mm-hmm. And I think that plays a very big role. Yes. When you eat. Eat like you know in Greece we have a three-hour lunch break. Oh, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. how much break do we get here? Right, 10, fifty minutes, twenty minutes maybe. Yeah. So you have to woof your food down. <laughs> you don't even get to enjoy it. Has that ever happened to you? Where you're oh, eating lunch, yeah. you're in a hurry, you look down and the, the plate is empty already, and like, did I eat everything already? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, the mindless eating, and that's the thing. We had two, three hours to eat. So we ate, we took an hour to eat, and then we took a nap afterwards. Right. So we ate mindfully our food. We chose, we choose, we, we chew that food. We didn't just swallow it. Yeah. And guess what? When you eat slow and mindful, you end up eating less food without even trying. Right. So that made a big difference. Also, we ate not under stress. Did you know, actually, you could be eating the same food, but depending on how you felt when you were eating it, mm-hmm. will have different effects on your health. So let's say you're eating something that's considered bad. Yeah. Just the fact that you feel that the food is bad and you're eating it, it will have worse effects on your body than if you ate the exact same food and feeling, you know, something, it's okay to eat it once in a while. Right. So that's why in Greece, we had a share fair, uh, fair share of uh, junk food. Mm-hmm. But when we ate it, we ate it guilt, guilt-free. guilt Yes. Which, by the way, junk food tastes much better when there's no guilt that follows it. Just, just <laughs> you know, always, it, it tastes so much better. It does. So, and again, nobody talks about that. And to me, the biggest one that it was drilled into our head as kids is eat out of true hunger. Yeah. How many nutritionists do you know or diets that teach people make sure you're hungry before you eat? Right. You never hear about it. No. Nah. And yet... When I lived in Greece as a child, it was drilled into our heads not to ruin our appetite before a meal. Right. So uh, in school, there was no lunch periods, by the way. We had like a 10 or 15 minute break between uh, classes. My mm-hmm. mother would give us money. And when we got hungry, because a lot of times, again, we did not eat breakfast, we would get a snack. Right. Now, if it was past 12 o'clock, even if I was hungry, I would not eat anything. Because I knew by 1 30, 2 o'clock, I had to be home to eat lunch. Right. So even as a child, I knew not to eat something, although I was hungry, because I wanted to be hungry when I got home. Right. We don't teach that to our kids anymore. And I think that's part of the reason why even our kids are so overweight. Yeah. You know, the kid, yeah, oh, I'm hungry, but we're eating it in an hour and they get a snack. Why are you getting a snack? You're going to eat in an hour, but I'm hungry now. So hunger is not an emergency. Right. And I think we've been taught that, you know, hunger is an emergency or something. And like I said, unless you're diabetic, unless you have some health issue. Yeah. The average person, nothing bad happens to you. I'm afraid good things happen. The body, I, I'm afraid I tell my clients that to look at hunger, change the way you view hunger. Mm-hmm. You see, most people view hunger as an emergency. I tell my clients, view it as an opportunity for your body to utilize the stored energy that you have. You fat, in other words. Mm-hmm. So by changing the way you look at it, all of a sudden, you don't mind being hungry for an hour or two because you're like, oh, great, I'm burning more fat now. Right. Or the fact that the body is recycling the mutated or dysfunctional cells. That's also great because, oh, right. I'm lowering my chance of developing cancer or right. is recycling uh, misfolded proteins during the time. Yeah. Do you see how all of a sudden you change your mindset? Yeah. And that's, to me, it's... 
what we need to do. We need to start changing the way we look at things mm -hmm. because the way we look at things affects how that food affects our health. It actually affects our health overall. Right. I'll give you another example. You could be eating the healthiest diet, but still ruin your health. Yeah. Based solely on the fact that if you're eating healthy stresses you out because you really don't enjoy the food and it takes a lot of effort for you to eat healthy, yeah. that stress actually it's bad for your health. Right. You're better off eating a diet that's not so healthy but creates less stress than eating a very healthy diet that creates stress. Right. And that's one thing is like when we ate in Greece, even when we ate, because again, we wouldn't eat, nobody ate perfect. We yeah. ate a fair share of junk food. But when we ate our junk food, there was no guilt. There was no feeling bad. Yeah. You know, I remember like uh, as a kid on the weekends, if there was a good movie on, my mother would get a, a potato, uh, potato chip and Coke or mm -hmm. Pepsi. <laughs> you know? And we had it. it. It was fine. But it was something we had once in a while. And when we did have it, we didn't feel guilty. Right. Yes, we knew it wasn't the best thing, but if you have it once in a while, nothing bad happens. Right. You know, does it, I mean, does it make sense though? I, mean, I think that's something that it, it's missing when people talk about the Mediterranean diet. Yes, that makes sense. I, you know, I, I think mindset is huge when it comes to losing weight. And I think, you know, I like the Mediterranean diet and the way it's, 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 you know, made and, and family members, you know, I remember when I, I went to Greece and I, you know, even when I was in Italy, it was, it was, you know, your biggest meal was at lunchtime yeah you know? and, you know, and breakfast, if you were hungry in, in Italy, they offered you a pastry if you were hungry. And that was, that was pretty much the extent, you know, and, and, uh, and a cup of espresso. And, uh, but you know, there was no big breakfasts like they're taught in America. You know, your biggest breakfast, should, your biggest meal should be breakfast. That That's what we're taught in America. Yes. So that's what you, that's what's embedded in our brain is that we should have a big, healthy breakfast, you know? And, um, you know, but I like, you know, I think it makes sense, you know, to have, you know, to spread out your meals and to eat, you know, it, like having a meal at eight o'clock and then not wait until the next, then wait until the next day, like spreading it out, you know, like intermediate fasting where you give your, your body time to digest this, break it down and then also burn fat. And if you're active, you know, you, you're going to be, you know, metabolizing and, and you're going to be burning the fat even when you're, when you, if you go exercise, even when you stop exercising. So exactly. as you keep active. You know, so I, I think it makes much more sense. And especially when you say mindset, because, you know, it, the way we think, it, it, ha it has such a huge impact on the way we behave. And if yes. we can really say to ourselves, like you mentioned to me earlier when we were talking about losing weight and I was joking around and, and well, not really joking around, but I've been trying to lose 10 pounds for the past 10 years and I've stayed the same. And, you know, you're saying change your mindset because I was telling you how cravings at nighttime is what ruins me all the time. And you said, change your mindset. And I, I think that makes sense is, is changing your mindset, changing the way you do things, you know, looking at, you know, the, looking at the Mediterranean diet, how healthy it is and the things that you don't do, you know, think about it. And I like how you said, you know, to focus on the positive effect about, you know, in your head, think about what you're going to look like if you lose the weight and that yeah. will motivate you to to actually stay on track because if you're thinking about it maybe if you lost one or two pounds and then you think about oh my god if i lost 10 pounds imagine that you know that's going to motivate you to want to be more diligent with yourself yes exactly that and i think also not to focus on all the obstacles and the problems that get in our way if you focus on the goal yeah, your subconscious mind will find a way to reach it. But I think sometimes we get an obstacle and then we start focusing too much on the obstacle. We start focusing too much. Yeah, but I'm getting cravings. And, yeah. we, and we're focusing on the problem. But remember, you get more of what you focus. Right. So if you're focusing on problems, you're going to get more problems. Yeah. If you're focusing on, on, uh, on what you want, well, I the subconscious mind can work miracles. Yeah. And you, uh, you'd be surprised how many solutions can... Uh, you can come up with when you're really focusing on the end result that you're looking for. Right. And that's the other thing too. We were talking about fasting before that you know, again, part of the cultures of the Mediterranean cultures is that we fasted regularly 
That's another thing that is never talked about. Uh, by the way, fasting for us, like for uh, religious purposes, is when we eliminate animal products from our diet for a certain for a certain period. Yeah, and we do it actually. It's it's, a, it's four major fasts per year, and actually happen to be every quarter. Right. And what's funny is that I read a study a few years back when they compared Greeks. They ate the same Greek diet, but the only difference between the two groups was one group followed the orthodox practice of fasting, and the other one did not. Mm -hmm. Tremendous difference in health. Oh, really? The fasting itself makes a difference. And the other rule that we had in in uh, in Greece, we ate meat. I would say once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. The true the true Greek cuisine is actually vegetarian cuisine. Okay. I would say four or five times a week we ate a vegetarian meal. Again, nothing against steaks. I like my steak too, mm -hmm. but it wasn't <laughs> something that we ate regularly. Yeah. Now they're telling us you've got to have meat every day. It says who? Oh, you yeah. need your protein. And I always laugh because they keep telling us about how much protein we need. Yeah. And if you have less, you can have a protein deficiency. And yet in Greece, we ate, like I said, animal product. We need that much. And yet there was no protein deficiencies. Right. How come? Is it possible that maybe they have exaggerated how much protein we need mm -hmm. by certain industries? Yeah. Without naming names? Right. You know what I mean? Think oh, Yeah. It. Because I think everything, unfortunately, a lot of the information that we get, it comes down to somebody making money on it. And that, yes. I think sometimes that's how a lot of misinformation has come out. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, we talked about uh, on, on the last show, we, we talked about how bacon and eggs became popular. Yes, yes, yes. It was a marketing campaign by Beach Nut Packaging Company to increase <laughs> the sales of bacon. That was back in 1921. Very successful campaign, by the way, <laughs> as we can see. It changes. <laughs> it changed how Americans eat breakfast. It was. It was a in an, an effort to increase the sales of a certain product. And again, look at all the studies on breakfast. Who is the major uh, companies? Who, who who's paying for those studies? Ninety nine percent of them are cereal companies. Yeah. And again, I, I like cereal. By the way, <laughs> I enjoy my cereal. But I I lot I will have cereal for lunch or for dinner sometimes. Yeah. So nothing wrong with cereal, but I think the timing is wrong. Right. And the uh, the other thing about, you know, like, you know, a lot of, we had like a big lunch and a small dinner usually. Yeah. But in the villages, the reverse was true. In the village where my mother was raised, they had a light lunch and a big dinner. Oh, really? And the reason was, yes. And it's interesting, though, is because in the villages, they didn't have a three-hour lunch break. They worked in the oh. fields, so they had a short break. So instinctively, okay. they knew, hey, I don't have time to eat my food mindful. You know, I don't have that much time to eat. And plus, I had to go back to work. Yeah. So it makes sense that they ate lighter and they made their dinner the main meal, which mm -hmm. they have more time to digest. Right. Because uh, in the ancient Greek times, we talk about Socrates' time. Yes. The saying was actually that if you want to live a long and healthy life, you should be content with eating one meal a day, only when you're hungry, mm -hmm. and never eat unless you have time afterwards to rest. Right. And so to me in the villages, I remember even myself where I was raised in, in, in the city, uh, when we, like in, in, uh, in September, we used to go back in the village to collect olives, and yes. we used to spend a couple of weeks back there. Mm -hmm. Automatically, we changed our main meal to dinner. Although in the city, we always had a big lunch and yes. a light dinner. Yes. In the village, we did the opposite. Right. Instinctively, we knew that, hey, if you have a big lunch, I can go back collecting olives again. I mm -hmm. want to take a nap. Right. And to me, he's like eating this big uh, breakfast, like they're pushing. What? Do you take a nap after eating breakfast? Do you rest afterwards? No, you have to go to work. Right. Well, digestion, what's the best thing you do for, di for digestion? Rest. This is, this is not some, uh, you know, uh, this is proven facts. Yeah, resting is the best thing to do. I mean, for the people who have dogs and cats, what mm -hmm. do they do after eating? <laughs> they rest. They rest. And here they're telling me, "Oh, don't eat uh, too late uh, because you don't want to go to sleep right after eating." Yeah. As long as you don't overeat and you don't stuff yourself. To me, nothing wrong with resting or even sleeping after eating a meal. Yeah. Now there is exceptions. There are always exceptions, but as a general rule, because I know some people. When they eat and then they and they lay down to sleep, they have a digestion problems. Right. There's always exceptions. 
Mm -hmm. As a general rule, to me, nothing wrong with resting after eating. And that's something that yeah. all Mediterranean cultures used to do. You hear in, in society that like that, I get, it's like a myth buster, but people say, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't rest after you eat. You should be moving around, you know, and, and you hear so many people say that, you know, no, no, move around after you eat. You shouldn't rest after you eat. You hear that all the time. Yes. But again, my question to them is how come uh, all these healthy cultures, they sleep or they nap or they rest right after eating the main meal? Right. They're not moving around. And if you look at how digestion works, the best thing to do for digestion is to rest. Yeah. This way, all the energy can go towards digestion. Right. And to me, like I said, it's funny. I had one client one time. She was a gastroenterologist. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about digestion and everything else. And she says to me, finally, a fitness professional that gets digestion, because all the other fitness professionals you went to, they were telling her exactly what you said, that, oh, you know, you eat your main meal uh, at breakfast or lunch. This way you can go become active afterwards. You can burn the calories. And yeah. nobody talked about resting after eating. Right. And after I explained to her, well, she already knew it wasn't telling anything. She denied it. <laughs> but she's like, it was nice to hear somebody that gets it. Right. And, and oh, the other thing I wanted to mention before I forget is about taking a break from food. Mm -hmm. You see, yes, food, what you eat is important because it provides the right nutrients for the body. Yeah. But the body also needs a break from food. Right. Because that's where, think of it this way. Uh, you have a car. And if they say you never bother taking the car to a mechanic for tune-up. Right. Okay, and to change the oil and do all this other stuff. Yeah. If you keep putting gas in your car and keep running it, what will happen to your car eventually? Right. We'll break down. It'll break down. Well, the body needs a tune-up. How does it get the tune-up? When you take a break from food. Yeah. And, and that's why the, that's where the 16 hours or longer, it's, it's to me, it's crucial for good health. And every so often, even longer than that, it's not a bad idea because the body goes into uh, maintenance mode. And that's right. where a lot, of the, a lot of the healing takes place. And that, to me, the nutrition industry doesn't emphasize that enough, the yeah. importance of taking a break from food. Right. And to me, somehow, the religions of the world, all religions, by the way, not just Christianity, all of them, have some form of fasting. Don't you find that fascinating that every single culture has some form of fasting? Yeah, it is very fascinating. And it's true. Almost every culture, pretty much all, have a form of fasting. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's variance how they fast, but at the end of the day, it's the same concept. Stop eating, give your body a break from food. And now science is, science is proving the benefits. Yeah. But I think one reason you really don't see it advertised that much it's really simple. Think about who spends the most money marketing things, the food industry, the drug industry. Yes. The food industry, are they interested in you not eating? No, nope. they want us to eat more as much as possible. Exactly. So do you think they can be promoting fasting? Of course not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're trying to get us overweight and unhealthy. By right. all means, no. They try to provide good food. But at the end of the day, the bottom line, they want you to eat something. Yeah. And to me, that's one reason why you don't hear about fasting as much as you hear about healthy food. You know, you hear about vegetables, you hear about a lot of good foods out there, yeah. but you hardly ever hear about fasting. No, you don't. Or, or my favorite line, whenever I read any research on fasting or in the article, have you noticed how they always finish with this line? More research is needed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How come they never see that line when they when they talk about the benefits of certain foods, okay, and all the research behind it? Mm -hmm. How come you never see that ending on that? Like more research is needed to make sure that this food is really healthy. Yeah, you never hear that. But whenever you read about fasting, oh, more research is needed. No, it's not. Fasting has been around for thousands of years. There's been yeah. plenty of research to prove the obvious. Exactly, a hundred percent. Now, what is a good diet? So you said that most uh, Mediterranean recipes include vegetarian-like recipes and then maybe two days of meat. Now, what about fish? Uh, we eat fish once a, once a week, but I would say to me, fish is also great. Uh, but my suggestion usually is to try to have, I would say, to I tell my clients at least two or three days a week that you're really a vegan. I, I don't think yeah. that's not a bad idea at all. 
No, I and agree then, with you. You know, and yes, have your steaks, have your fish, you know, have everything else that you like. But I think two or three days a week, it's great yeah. to be a vegan. As a matter of fact, in Greece, the rule is that Wednesdays and Fridays throughout the year, you're not supposed to eat meat on those days. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, again, you look at some of the rules and like back then they just explained it that, you know, that's what the Orthodox Church says to so just do it and be quiet. <laughs> but come to find out a lot of the rules that the church has set come to find out that it's really good for our health yeah so who knows what the real reason is but the only the fact we know is that it's good for our health yeah so as far as like to me as far as what to eat uh i do believe that a diet should be made up uh, a big part from fruits and vegetables and i don't think there's too much argument there i mean right. studies have shown i don't really exist the statistic but i think people that we eat uh, i think they want to say four or five servings of fruits and vegetables per day have mm -hmm. a 50 percent lower chances of developing cancer which i wow. think is a great benefit yeah you know? and by the way the other thing i forgot to mention the only proven way to live longer is to decrease the overall amount of food that you're eating yeah the less you eat the longer you live and part of the reason has to do with the fact that, do you know what's one of the byproducts of digestion? Even if you're eating healthy food, by the way, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Free radicals. What, <laughs> what do free radicals do? Right. It ages you faster. Yeah. So the less often you eat and the less overall you eat, the, free rad the less free radicals your body produces, mm -hmm. that's a huge benefit. And right. never mind that the other byproduct is the misfolded proteins, which is another byproduct of digestion. Again, you could be eating health, doesn't really matter. Yeah. So the less often you eat, the less misfolded proteins you produce, the less of a chance you have of developing a lot of the mental diseases. Right. So again, it's not a coincidence that if you look at healthy regions, the amount that they eat, they eat a lot less than we do. I was looking at the Okinawa study. Yeah. Uh, Okinawa, people eat, I just remember, I think it was around, uh, the average was around 1,300 calories uh, per day. Mm-hmm. But even if you go by the height to weight ratio, uh, the height to weight yeah. According to our formulas, they're under eating. Right. So to me, it's like, wait a minute. Obviously, they're not under eating because if they were under eating, they would have been skeletons and we would be dead by now. <laughs> so could it be that our formulas are off? Right. They're overestimating how much food we really need. Yeah. And again, who came up with those formulas? Right. And I'll tell you one more thing, which is interesting. Do you know who is the biggest pusher? of uh, exercise equipment and exercising and activity, the food industry. Oh, really? Yes, because they're trying to convince us that, you know, exercise more. Don't eat less, exercise more. Right. And to me, the the healthiest choice, obviously, you yes, you want to be active. The yeah. healthier choice is always to eat less. Right. There's a much healthier choice. And it, costs, it saves you money too, by the way, which I think it's a nice benefit. Yeah. Definitely. It does. I, you know, I, I think that's a great idea. You know, it's, it's funny, but most of the marketing is done by, by in different industries and, and they're promoted by in different industries. And I always say to people, look, you know, look at where they're getting their facts from, you know, yes. and, uh, I, I, so many people I see on the internet, they read them, they read these articles, they, they follow it through. They think it's everything and they think it's like gold and they don't even know where the resources are coming from. They don't know how accurate the information is. And I, I think that's why so many people get confused because there's so many different things out there. And a lot of it is inaccurate. And, and, uh, and I think even in today's society, we have to really focus on what we really put into our bodies. I love the Mediterranean diet. I, I grew up on the Mediterranean diet. My, my father actually got his diabetes controlled by, by eating, you know, he, well, he's used to it, but you know, by, yeah. by eating the Mediterranean diet and he actually cut his meals down to one meal. And then if he got hungry, he had a little snack, but that was about it. And he, he lost the extra weight and he actually, his weight stabilized and his diabetes went back to normal. Nice. And, uh, so it, it does make a difference what we put in our bodies, you know, and, and, you know, how much we eat and how long, because I think we're our society in America where, you know, we have so many snacks, people are grabbing granola bars in between. It's like one of the worst things you could do is have a granola bar, especially if you're trying to lose weight. You yeah. Know? And, uh, 
you know, we, we got too many wrong messages out there on, cause there's so many things out there, so many fad diets, there's so many companies selling so many different programs. And it's just, it's very confusing for somebody who doesn't understand, you know, which, what should I do? What's the best option? You know, um, for people who are out there and they're so confused, can you explain to them the, the importance of why, you know, eating a Mediterranean diet and having a good mindset is better than most of these programs and products out there? Yeah, I actually, I'm going to answer this this question by telling you about this debate that I had on the radio station one time. Mm -hmm. They had brought in what I like to call a regular nutritionist. Yeah. And we went back and forth about our beliefs and we had studies to back everything we said. And, you know, there was, you know, we kept going back and forth, back and forth. I had my studies, she had her studies. And at the <laughs> end, I said to her, you know, we could be here all day talking about studies. I can find a study to prove whatever I want. Right. Here's my question. Can you show me one healthy culture that eats the way that you guys are recommending? There isn't one. Right. If you look at all healthy cultures, the, the food that they eat might vary. But you know what does not vary? The fact that breakfast is not a main meal. The fact that they, on average they eat no more than twice a day. The fact that they do some form of fasting uh, through, throughout the year. Yeah. The fact that they actually they eat a low meat diet. Right. Those facts do not vary. Right. So to me, it's like whatever you look at a program and the whatever, you know, the look at the program. And the first question I'll tell people to ask themselves, can I see myself? living with the advice that they're giving me for the rest of my life right if the answer is no don't even bother starting yeah because you are not going to say in other words i tell people can you count calories for the rest of your day yeah for you, you know, no don't bother starting then yeah or can you can you eat a low carb diet for the you know, always meat all the time right even people who like meat eventually get sick of it yeah you know i never mind all the other problems that that kind of diet has but yeah. to me, can you live like that? We were talking about before about this, you know, uh, type of diets that you eat only two or three foods, like, you know, the cabbage diet or whatever. <laughs> yeah. All of them work. Absolutely. You're going to lose weight. The question is, can you live with it? Yeah. And if you cannot live with it, don't even bother starting. Exactly. And so to me, it's like, you know, the Mediterranean diet, I think is plenty of variety because of those habits, by the way. And that's the other point I wanted to make was... Because we eat only out of true hunger, we eat slow and mindful, and we, on average, don't eat more than twice a day, we can have bread with every meal. Mm -hmm. Now, here they're telling us, oh, carbs are bad. How come we're eating bread with every single meal? We're eating pasta, potato, rice pretty much every day, and yet our weight was not affected. Right. How come carbs didn't bother us? It's because of those habits. And I think that's one thing is that by learning what I like to call how and why you eat, Yeah. what happens is... What you eat, you, you don't have to be as strict with what you eat. The diet yeah. all of a sudden becomes less restrictive. So mm -hmm. you can eat all the foods that you like. Right. And to me, it doesn't work. The question I always ask people is like, would you rather eat more often, but be very strict with what you eat? Right. Or would you rather eat less often, but eat whatever you want? Right. I take the second one. In the, well, that's why I live now anyway. I take that any day of the week. Right. And this way I can eat my pasta, everything I love, including yeah. my ice cream, my chocolate, you know, all the good stuff too. Right. You know? Exactly. I, I'm think... a realist. <laughs> I could see. It's, you know, what I think is great is that I, I think people, you know, if you make it a lifestyle change and, and you don't think of it as a diet, then it becomes natural. I just got a Greek cookbook and it was like 500 pages of Mediterranean recipes. So it's yeah. like there's so many different things you could do and so many different things you could eat. You're not really restricted. There's so many, there's so many things you can make that are healthy. And, you know, and, and, you know, people just have to, you know, take the time out and they're easy meals too. Like, you know, if you don't like to cook and you don't, and you're come home, you're tired, you don't want to prepare a meal, you know, there are lots of easy ways to, to just put something together really quickly if you have the food in your fridge and then and you're fine you know yeah and uh and and it's just what you're putting in your mouth you know and uh and like you said if you're fasting you know most of the day you could have that you know that that meal you know and not feel guilty or worried exactly then you know and then when you mentioned about the carbs i thought to myself well when i was in greece and even when i was in italy 
and any part of Europe, they were walking all the time. You know, yes. they, they yeah. you know, and that was the difference that you see over here versus over there is that they either had the mopeds or they were walking. And most of the time they were walking and, and just by walking, you know, that was enough exercise, you know, to keep them nice and slim, you know, because they were eating, they were resting after they were eating. And then when they had to go somewhere, they walked wherever they had to go to. So, you know, it wasn't strenuous exercise. It was just regular walking. Yeah, that's a very good point you're making. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, again, we'll go back to the fitness industry that they're, they're teaching us all these rules. You got to get your heart rate up to 65%. Uh, you have to do at least 20 minutes. And they completely ignore like low intensity, continuous exercise. Mm -hmm. And to me, like I remember in Greece, again, we walked everywhere. I remember as tradition, we would go out to a restaurant at night. We didn't just go and plop down at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. We went back and forth on the main street four or five times before we sat down to eat. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, we walk a little bit more. And like a casual walk, though, you didn't even get your heart. You got you hurried up probably just a little bit. Yeah. But the casual walk, unfortunately, by the fitness is dismissed. Right. And we like, oh, it's nothing. Yeah. If you're joining the next Olympics, that's nothing. I agree. <laughs> but for health, it does plenty good. I mean, walking alone can help you with your joints. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Like when I lived in Greece, hip and knee problems did not exist. Right. How come? Because the walking process helps lubricate the joints, keeps the joints healthy. Yeah. That nobody talks about that. And no. the thing is, and that's part of the problem that I think I think the fitness industry has made is like they made people believe that in order to be fit, you gotta exercise hard, you gotta push, you gotta do three sets, you gotta push to the max. And I'm like, you gotta do all those things if you trying out for the next Olympics. Yeah. If you're not doing that, focus on being active, small amounts of activity, and consistency is the key. Yes. And the thing is, low amounts of activity, it's much easier to sustain. Like, in other words, walking. Get used to walking to your mailbox and back. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Go and yes. check your mailbox. Take little short walks around. Uh, take the stairs whenever you can. There's like a lot exactly. of little things that we can do. And my biggest pet peeve, pet peeve, by the way, is that I hear this all the time when people buy their last house, okay, and they're getting older. And yeah. they say, oh, I got to get a, a ranch a style house this way. I don't have to take stairs. Like that's the worst thing you can do. <laughs> Buy a house with the stairs. The stairs are what keeping you in shape. Yeah. But we already have this mindset. Oh, I'm getting old. I should stop going to this. I, I should have a house without stairs. Right. Why? And, and we, there's a lot of little things that we can change in our life. Yes. The, li the fitness become part of our life. So this way we want to go to the gym. Yeah. And that's what I teach my clients is that we need, in a sense, to deformalize exercising Yeah, by making it part of our everyday life. And this way, we don't have to waste any time going to the gym. Exactly. Exactly. I've seen more people get hurt doing strenuous exercise than anything else. I've seen so many people, you know, trying to lift heavy weights or exercising for long periods of time, and they 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 ruin their knees. They get knee problems. They, you know, I knew one person that played sports and she had to get her hip replacement, you know, wow. because just the strenuous of consistency, playing soccer all the time, you know, it just it took a toll on her on her body. I had another person, how many people I've seen have, have torn ligaments or tendons, you know, in their arm or, or, you know, and, and, or have shoulder problems, you know? So it's, it's really, you know, you, you don't have to do that strenuous exercise to, to, to stay in fit. Sometimes, the, like you said, the low resistance is probably the best bet and you get just yeah. as much benefits, you know, doing that. Now, if you had to tell the audience, if you had to give three takeaways today, what would you like to really emphasize to people? Uh, to me, the first one is take a break from food three or four times a week. That would be my first one. Also, the second one is don't try to change your diet overnight. My suggestion on that is uh, find the worst thing that you eat. Because remember, we eat usually the same four or five, no, more like the same 15 to 20 dishes that we rotate through every month. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, what my suggestion is, instead of trying to change all those meals, mm -hmm. find the worst one, get rid of it, 
and, in, in, and replace it with a healthier choice. Mm -hmm. Once the healthier choice becomes easy for you to add to, to eat and to make, add another one. Right. Don't, and that's the best way to start changing what you eat. Right. Okay. And my third advice would be, uh, the as far as exercise is concerned, the first goal of an exercise program is not results. Right. The first goal is to make exercising habitual. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is by starting with very small steps. Right. So you want to develop the walking habit? Great. Start walking four or five times a week for mm -hmm. one to five minutes. Right. You can't tell me you cannot find one to five minutes every day to walk. Exactly. But 20 minutes, on the other hand, you could. Right. But one to five minutes, you can't. And once you get into the habit of walking for one to five minutes, well, yes. then it's much easier to build up from that. Yes. So that would be my three uh advice that I, I think that would be huge help to to the audience i like that advice it, 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 and i think it's very 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 beneficial you know i think it you know you know just like you said it, you know losing weight does not have to be hard you know it, no the right way it could come very easy and uh i think and i think yeah because i i think one of the pro biggest problems i find in the fitness industry and i've been in it for uh over 30 years now they've become extremely impractical. Mm -hmm. The advice is so impractical to live with. And as a matter of fact, that's why I call myself the practical fitness coach. <laughs> you know, because I think it's become so impractical that, see, a lot of the fitness professionals, yes, they want to help. I agree, 100%. But they forgot people have a life to live. Yeah. And people don't live to exercise or to watch a diet. Yeah. They want to have a lean, healthy body so they can better enjoy their life. Exactly. If the process of getting the lean, healthy body makes your life miserable. Right. What is the point? Right. And I think that's what we need to get back to. We need to get back to the basics. Yeah. And the basics is what we just talked about. You know, simple things like eat less often. Eat right. more mindful. Exactly. Don't worry so much about what you're eating in the beginning. Focus on changing those habits. You got those down. Then start worrying about, okay, let me start eating better quality food. Right. Like instead of making better choices. Exactly. But, you know what I mean? And don't try to change overnight. Nobody, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, like the saying goes. <laughs> so a, a lean and healthy body is not going to be built in a day. But if you do, exactly. if you take your time and do it the right way, then you only have to do it once. Right. Because, uh, the one thing I want to say here really quick, I just remembered. Uh, I always tell people, this slow and steady way of losing weight, mm -hmm. it only seems slow. But in reality, is the fastest way to lose weight because you only have to do it once. Right. You know what I mean? How many people yeah. do you know who lose weight fast and they keep losing the same 20 pounds for the past 20 years? Yeah. And they're still overweight. If you <laughs> took your time, you only have to do it once. Right. And you're done. You know, once mm -hmm. and done. Right. I like that. You know? I like that a lot. Now, you offer a whole bunch of different services. Can you tell everybody a little about what the services are? The Yeah, the, my main uh, service is the my coaching. My I, I do like online coaching. Uh, to learn more about my online coaching, you can go to thepracticalfitnesscoach.com. And there you can actually, I offer a, a free discovery call if you want to learn more about how my services work. And Zep, by the way, is absolutely free and absolutely no high pressure sales pitch at the end because i know a lot of people avoid those uh discovery calls mm -hmm. because to me it's all about teaching people and how to lose weight the right way because i think is uh the fitness industry has taken the wrong turn yeah and although they want to help they don't understand the average person who wants to be in shape but don't want to make their life all about fitness yeah and to me i'm all about practical uh approach to weight loss right you know? So that's the one. And uh, the other one is I offer is this online uh, self-paced program that's mm -hmm. called the Stubbers Method. And that one actually, again, it will take you through all the habits and uh, on your own, but you watch one video at a time. It teaches you one habit. And until you apply it, you don't even watch the next video. Yeah. And the idea is to gradually change your behaviors. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, so it's the practicalfitnesscoach.com, correct? Yes. I yep. like that a lot. That's this the is... uh unlock for the online coaching. Like I said, if when the people go on that site, they'll see the button for the uh, free discovery call. 
and I hope they uh, they take me up on it. You, you're going to learn a lot. You know, I, I think it's something that's well needed in our society. And like I said, there's so many things out there confusing people. People don't know what the right answer is. And I think it's easiest to lose weight when you are guided with a partner. When you partner up with somebody and you have someone on your team, whether they're losing weight with you or they're just teaching you the right way to lose weight, just having that support, that guidance and that direction means a lot and, can, and it goes a long way. Yeah, I agree because I think I always tell people that it's it, you know, people are more likely to let themselves down to and mm -hmm. then let somebody else down. Exactly, and I think having somebody checking it, checking up on you. Because I've used coaches myself for my business and for other aspects that I needed help with. And yeah, I found having the coach and somebody to answer to every week. Yeah, it made me follow through. Yeah, where a lot of the stuff that we that that I teach, a lot of stuff you can find on the internet. It's, yeah. There's nothing, you know, you can find all this information in, in the, on the internet nowadays. Applying it is yes. the problem. And I always tell people the solution to sustainable weight loss has two parts. Right. Part one is knowing the right habits that we talked about. Exactly. Part two is knowing how to apply those habits into your life without yes. burning yourself out and making exactly. them habitual. You know, hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that's the key, not burning yourself out because once people get burned out then they give up and they go back to their old habits. And that's when they gain everything that they, they lost, they gain back and, some, and then some. And so if you can find a way to do it, like you teach and just, and just lose the weight and then just effortlessly keep it off. It, it it's something that it's, it's, it's a tool that's very valuable that, that everybody could use in their life. Actually. Yeah. And the, I tell you though, the, the one comment I get a lot from my clients that have been through my program is that if I knew how simple and easy the whole process was, I would have yeah. done it years ago. Cause right. I think a lot of times people hesitate because they feel it's going to be hard. It's going to yeah. take willpower. It's going to take motivation. And I'm here to tell you, it takes a lot less willpower than you think and yeah. actually no willpower at all mm -hmm. to maintain right. if you do it the right way. Exactly. But, you know, to me, motivation, it's something you cannot rely on because motivation mm -hmm. comes and goes. Sometimes you're motivated, sometimes you're not. Right, exactly. And the, the, one of the things I like is, it's not mine, by the way. I, know, I don't know where I heard it, but mm -hmm. it's because motivation gets you started. Mm -hmm. Habits, they keep you going. Yes, yes, yes. You know, like so to me, I use motivation to help people develop the right habits. But mm -hmm. once you develop them, you don't even need me or anyone else, right, to stick with them. And that's what we want to we want to do what we want to get to. And another thing that's not good for business, but I always like to use it. I don't want clients for life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? My job as a coach is to help you become independent, yeah. including for me, right. That's the job of a coach is to make you develop all the right habits and then be able to maintain them on your own. Exactly. Well, that's a you good know? coach. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, th this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Stavros, for coming on the show. And well, thank uh, you for having me, Stacey. Your, your advice is so, you have just a, a whirlwind of advice and it, it, it's so valuable. And this is something we need to hear and, and learn about because, you know, in our society, we have so many people who are struggling to, to lose weight and nobody, you know, sometimes, not, not nobody, but a lot of people just don't know what to do. And so having, having a fitness coach and having a person who can give you the right answers and give you the guidance is, is what this society needs. So thank you so much. And this has been a great show and your advice has been amazing. So thank you. Thank you. You have a great day. You too.